Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you, Lord, just for blessing us and bringing us together. I ask right now, Lord, you just speak to us clearly right now. Give us revelation of what we are about to, Father God. Partake of, Father God, and reveal yourself to each of us. May we all glean something that is useful and beneficial from this teaching today that you've given us and open our minds, expand our minds and our hearts and our spirits, Father God, to understand the significance of what you're speaking this day and this time right now. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 All right. Did you take out? Self squared away here. Okay. Somebody's unmuted. Uh, Okay, just bear with me. I'm trying to get it lined up here. For some reason, it's not set up. That's okay. I'll go on. All right. Well, good morning again, everybody that's here. Hopefully, everybody can hear me okay. Um, once again, we, we have, a, have a topic that God gave to me probably about a month or so ago. And uh, I, I pray that it would uh, be as significant to everyone else as it is to me. Uh, and hopefully you can understand it because I feel challenged to really connect everything to make it. Uh, and I don't like to use the word make sense. I, I pray that we get the revelation of the significance of what I, God is, uh, wants me to uh, impart today. So with that being said, uh, the topic that uh, I've given this sermon is a living sacrifice to God a living sacrifice to God. And our basic scripture, the foundation is gonna be uh, Romans 12, of course, pretty evident. Romans uh, chapter 12, verses one through 21. And that, that's how we're gonna conclude. But before we get to that living sacrifice, to those scriptures, I, I'm going to attempt to connect the significance behind what I think the Apostle Paul was writing, what I feel was revealed about the significance of what he was writing in this. Because when I thought about it, I read it a number of times, and those know, know, know me know that that's one of my favorite scriptures, not my basic, Romans 12, 1 and 2. And I had to really ponder and think about all the times I thought of a uh, sacrifice I always thought a sacrifice is something that was lost. <laughs> I don't know if anybody has had the same perspective. When you say you got to sacrifice something, this is gone. And then if you go back to the Old Testament, and we we're going to go there in a minute, you would just think about something that died. Whatever was sacrificed no longer existed. It had been given to God, and that was the end of it. But we have to notice that what Paul wrote, the Apostle Paul wrote in Romans 12 was, to submit our bodies as a living sacrifice. And now that's a, a difference from uh, what we see in all the, for lack of a better word, the Old Testament. And, and I'm gonna read, go back to Leviticus here in a minute. So when we start thinking about living sacrifice, that's a new perspective. So hopefully I can, God, uh, uh, give me the clarity to adjust it and show the difference in the impact of a sacrifice in the Old Testament times and sacrifice in the New Testament times, because it was a transition. And, and preferably I can make it clear, and, uh, but I, I pray God will reveal it to us. And the reason for this is that as believers, it is important to know what the Most High desires of us to do on a daily basis. See, I, we talked about that in various degrees, uh, for years, even before KCM, that the whole purpose of a relationship with God is the daily purpose. It's not just to wait to the end of the week and you know, the middle of the week and gather, okay, that's it. No, God's purpose, God's intent is for us to have a way of operating, a way of presenting ourselves each day <laughs> and not just you know, on the, uh, what we call the, the church days. God wants us, wants all believers to live in and to live, we want all believers' lives, sorry, to be an expression of his kingdom here on earth. 
Therefore, it is vital to know how to fulfill God's desire for each of our lives. And, and that is the intent. That is the, the entire reason I think God gave me this message. So at the end of the day, if we don't, we will either receive revelation of God's desire for our lives, or we will receive confirmation of what God has, has been directing us to do. And that way we get security in knowing that I am doing what God wants me to do. And I don't need anybody else to conform it. I don't need, you don't need, none of us will need to know does my life need to conform to some church doctrines or am I free to commune directly with God and live my life according to God's will irregardless to what church doctors must say, what circumstances must say. And, and that can be challenging because sometimes, you know, if you're like me, I thought, well, the only time I can represent God is when I'm at church. <laughs> I don't know if anybody else suffered from that. I pray not. <laughs> but it's real easy to lapse into that. The only time God is important, the only time God has an impact on the way I conduct myself. You know, you know, we try not to do certain things during the during the week and conduct ourselves a certain way. But when we're in church, it's like, okay, I done went from my B game to my A game on Sundays. Or my B game to my A game on Sunday, on Wednesday night Bible study. See, God wants us to be on our his A game all the time, 24-7. See, matter of fact, we are never to deviate from God's A game. So once we know that, to me, it'll give us the comfort and first how we are. And we're going to go through some things and Hopefully I won't go too long, but I may uh, have the comfort to know that, okay, in doing this, this is pleasing God. <laughs> because I'll tell you what, brothers and sisters, I've been there and done that. Me and Pastor Dave and others talked about it. We can be real easy and we will not even maybe be conscious that we would do things to please other people without even knowing we pleasing other people. Because you can get to some congregation, if you don't like fit into the paradigm there, you won't be comfortable. You won't be welcomed. They may not tell you to leave, but you don't feel like a vital part. <laughs> but when we know that right now, when we start talking about a living sacrifice, hopefully at the end of, of this discussion, we will know that, hey, I have the ability to relate directly with God and do what he's telling me to do and to be confident in knowing that I am representing God without the need for a bunch of religious checkpoints or religious restrictions. So we're talking about a living sacrifice. Uh, I'm gonna struggle not to go into 12, but let's only look at some foundation here to, to see where we stand or what position we have with God as far as this sacrifice. So if you would, please, let's turn to Leviticus chapter one. Leviticus chapter one. Leviticus chapter one, we're going to read verses one through nine. And understand we're talking about the Old Testament uh, regulations for the sacrifice. Hopefully everyone is there. Leviticus one, starting with verse one reads, now the Lord called to Moses, and spoke to him before the tabernacle of meeting, saying, speak to the children of Israel and say to them, when any of you bring an offering to the Lord, you shall bring your offering of the livestock to the herd and of the flock. If his offering is a burnt sacrifice of the herd, let him offer a male without blemish. He shall offer it of his own free will at the door of the tabernacle of meeting before the Lord. Then he shall put his hand on the head of the burnt offering, and it will be accepted on his behalf to make atonement for him. That's the purpose of the sacrifice, to make atonement for the individual that bring in the sacrifice. Because see, the individual sin, but the animal is going to pay the price. The individual humans commits the sin, but at this time, the animal had to be bought as a substitution for the human being, for that atonement, because the wages of sin fell, falls upon the human. The animal didn't sin. The animal's incapable of sin. They don't have free will. 
But understand, this is an important thing. The animal is offered on behalf of the human being. So the human being is sin, but the, the, the animal is going to be sacrificed to make atonement for him. And well, I'm going to go a little deeper and finish and then go. Verse 5 says, Then he shall kill the bull before the Lord and the priest. Uh, it should kill the, the, the bull before the Lord. And the priest, Aaron's son, shall sprinkle, shall bring the blood and sprinkle the blood all around the altar by the door of the tabernacle of meeting. And he shall skin the burnt offering and cut it into pieces. The son of Aaron, the priest, shall put the fire on the altar and lay the wood in order on the fire. Then the priest, Aaron's son, shall lay the parts, the head, and the fat in order on the wood that is on the fire upon the altar. But he shall wash the entrails and its legs with water, and the priest shall burn all the altar, shall burn on the altar as a burnt sacrifice and offering made by fire, a sweet aroma to the Lord. And I'm not just pulling out this particular uh, offering, or this sacrifice, but when we see that the animal is bought, once the individual commits it to the Lord and kills it, it is turned over to the priest. The person doesn't offer the sacrifice to the, to the Lord. The priest does. You have to be a priest. The priest is between the humankind and God. So sacrifice have to be offered by to the priest and presented to God by the priest. So only priests are authorized to offer the sacrifice to the Lord. That's a key point. Please remember that. Only the priest do. You have to be a priest to offer a sacrifice. You have to be a priest, a priest. I'm just saying a priest because <laughs> we're going to start talking about everything. And, and in this time, you had to be a Levite. You had to be uh, one of every son to be a priest. So now we've established that the priests are the ones authorized to offer the sacrifice. We're going to see where that is, where, where that is key. So now we see this foundation right now set up. Okay, so we're thinking, going back to a living sacrifice. So if a living sacrifice, and actually you look in Romans 12, Paul, Paul said, present your body a living sacrifice. Well, wait a minute, how can I do that, Paul? Because <laughs> we just saw that God word established that only priests could bring a sacrifice before the Lord. You see, it almost looked like, okay, we have a problem, but we don't. Let's turn to Matthew chapter 26. And if you remember, as uh, Mr. Joe said, has been ministering about the covenant, we're going to see the change of dynamics and the change of relationship that God has under the old covenant versus the new covenant. Because I did a little research and, and initially before the law was given, the head of the family was considered the priest of the family. Mm -hmm. But once the law was established, then the priesthood was shifted from the individuals to uh, the ironic priesthood of the Levites. To understand, it, it wasn't always like this. Before the law was given, the, the head of the family was considered the peace. He was considered the intermediary between the family and between the people and God. So now we are in a, what's going transition to a new covenant. But for a new covenant, it's got to be a change of role. There's got to be new empowerment. It's just like you get a new contract or there's an amendment to a contract. You start to add provisions to it. So that it's, it's not gone done away with. The whole thing that God was showing is that the wages of sin is death. And you represent that pain, that atonement is by the blood because that's what a life is. That means God says, for sin, you have to give me your life. But I will accept the life of this animal on your behalf. You continue to live. The animal has to die to uh, submit the, uh, the blood. And that the blood, that, that was just for an atonement. It didn't wipe away sin. That's the key thing. It didn't wipe it away. It's almost like I use the analogy going to court and... <laughs> Fortunately, I hope pray nobody's had to go through this procedure, but some may know you can go to court. If you're not ready for the judge to rule, 
you can ask for a uh, what do they call it? Uh, I had it then a continuance. <laughs> That means, hey, you're still, you know, under the charges. <laughs> the charges are still valid. We're just not going to adjudicate it today. And I don't know the law well enough to know how many continuances you can get, but that atonement, the way I, for me to understand it, I understand that animal sacrifice is just getting a continuance because God's judgment is coming. The judgment, not on the animal's judgment, is with mankind. Eventually, as humans, we have to deal with God. You see the significance in there, but let's look at Matthew chapter 26. And uh, actually, Pastor Stanley has made reference to this before, so I'm not going to take credit for it. I hopefully can clarify or just really expound upon what he's taught this dynamic. Because we look at Matthew chapter 26. Let's look at uh, start verse 57. Now we really want to get the significance of seeing all these years there's been animal sacrifices. But we do realize that at some point that ended, right? I think we all are aware of that. <laughs> you no longer brought animals to the priest. That stopped. Why did that stop? Let's, I'm going to attempt to show why it stopped. 57 reads. And those, it's talking about when the uh, temple gods or whatnot came out to the uh, Gethsemane to arrest Christ. And those, and when, and those who had laid hold of Jesus, led him away to Caiaphas, the high priest. That's important. They took him to the high priest, where the scribes and the elders were assembled. But Peter followed him at a distance to the high priest's courtyard and went and went in and sat with the servants to see the end. Now the chief priests, the elders, and all the council sought false testimonies against Jesus to put him to death. Verse 60, but none but found but found none. They didn't find any. Even though many false witnesses came forward, they found none. But at last, two false witnesses came forward and said, this fellow said, I am able to destroy the temple of God and to rebuild it in three days. And the high priest rose and said to him, do you answer nothing? What is it these men testify against you? But Jesus kept silent. And the high priest answered and said to him, I put you on the oath by the living God to tell us if you are the Christ, the Son of God. And Jesus said to him, now understand, Jesus is submitting to the fact that he's still a high priest. Because now he's putting him on the oath. And it obviously by him invoking that, Jesus felt compelled to answer. Because before he hadn't said it, they were saying, okay, now I want you to say before God who you are. See the shift in that dynamic? Before they just having this little fake trial. But now the high priest is off to realize that he is a priest. Okay, I know one trick to get him to talk. I'll make him put him on the oath to God. So in other words, that Christ is not really talking to him anymore. He's really talking under the authority and in reference to the fact that he's invoked the name of the most high. So God, I'm not going to know that you high priest don't really matter, but God matters in everything. So in 64, Jesus said, it is as you said, nevertheless, I say to you, hereafter you shall see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the power and coming in the clouds of heaven. He's like, hold up, now, now you're talking, <laughs> you done freaked the high priest out. Like, hold up, you were quiet, and now I done tried to trick you, and you telling me I'm going to see you sitting up in there? <laughs> just think about the, the gravity of that statement he just made to the high priest. <laughs> So, okay, you want to bring God in this now? Okay, you don't understand. You don't, you don't come into my land. You don't come into my area. Yes, I'm going to reply to you. I'm going to tell you everything. And, well, but just think about this. You said this to the, to the high priest. Then the high priest, verse 65, tore his clothes saying, he has spoken blasphemy. What further need do we have of witnesses? Look now, we have heard his blasphemy. What do you think? They answered and said, he is deserving of death. Now the high priest and his little gang feel they have manipulated Christ into committing blasphemy, so they want him put to death for that. 
Now, we know they didn't want him put to death for that if you study through the whole thing. They wanted to kill Jesus anyway for any reason because he was bad for their business. But the, the dynamic is here, if you look back in Leviticus on the Day of Atonement, that sacrifice had to be brought to the high priest. And this is what Pastor Stanley, Stanley taught us about, to the high priest, because he was the only one fit, authorized to offer this atonement sacrifice to God on the Day of Atonement. So that was that scenario where it said it just wasn't like, oh man, they just bombarded Jesus and killed him. And this, no, 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 no. It was all spiritual. It was all played out. There was a change coming. There was a shift coming in the way things were done. There was a shift coming in our ability to, to uh, relate to God. Because we see when Christ was fought for the, bought before the high priest, he was found guilty of death. They've said that. The action by the high priest set in motion the offering of Christ who became the first living sacrifice. This I see as the foundation for Paul to go in on and challenge believers to become a living Christ sacrifice because Christ is now becoming the first living sacrifice. How did he do that? Christ's blood paid, paid, the, paid the price of all of those continuously. All of that sin debt had been piling up. All of that sin debt had just been put on hold because the blood of the animals couldn't pay it. The debt was still owed. Now, when Christ was crucified and laid down his life, his blood paid all of the debt of sin. Let that sink in. It paid all of the debt. You go all the way back to the beginning of time. His blood paid all that debt. Everything. So now since the wages of sin is death, Christ's blood, his sacrifice, laying down his life, shedding his blood, had paid all of that sin debt. <laughs> so since the wages of sin is debt, now, Christ has paid it all. Guess what? He could not stay dead because <laughs> the price is paid. He had to be set free. That's why when he gave his life and the debt was paid, God had to restore his life because the debt was paid. It's almost like you have someone lay away when you go pay it off. You get to take it out. Now it's free. It's yours. Christ had to death, death had to release him because there was no more debt. There was no more legal authority for Christ to remain dead. And when we look at the resurrection or the crucifixion, you see not only did Christ come up, that was a resurrection of others. So they were seen walking around in Jerusalem. I'd have been there. That would have freaked me out. I'm like, hold up. He done paid all of that. <laughs> everybody free, like a jailbreak, like you walk in Alcatraz. Hey, guess what? Everybody free. The governor had given everybody a mass pardon. All the prisoners in every jail, everywhere. You've been pardoned. Your debt has been paid. Seven free. See, death could not hold Christ down anymore because the debt was paid. What was needed to alleviate that death was taken care of on the cross. So Christ had to be raised up. And therein was the difference. That's why there's no need to sacrifice animals anymore. And I'm not going to left off what I've heard some people talk about reestablishing the 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 the, the uh, tabernacle or the the holiest holy go back to them animal sacrifice that is pure madness. The debt has been paid. Christ became and is the first living sacrifice. That's why he's called the first fruit of many. But what he did, he did what we don't have to do anymore. We don't bring animals to the most high anymore. We bring ourselves. Now, why are we authorized to bring ourselves? <laughs> I'm glad you asked. <laughs> Let's turn to First Peter. Chapter 2. Well, this is significant to know. And we regress the concept that from the 
death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, that this price, price is paid, that all sacrifices unto God now, and the word sacrifice, forgive me, I went up further, I wanted to define it before. Sacrifice does not mean death. It merely means that which is presented to God. So nothing has to die to be a sacrifice. It just has to be offered to the Lord. It has to be offered to the Lord. It just has to be offered to the Lord. That's why I asked the Lord to play that song. We give ourselves away. We offer ourselves to the Lord. Now, how are we authorized to offer ourselves to the Lord? Because I mean that is that is very, very vital for this modern believer to know that we offer ourselves to the Lord. We understand once we offer it to the Lord, it's his. But like Christ, because Christ offered himself to the Lord, if you look back in um, Matthew, and you can write, you're taking notes, in Matthew 26, you look back through 30, verses 39 through 42, it's familiar, we've gone through it where Christ was, was praying, because he said, I, if it's possible, let this cup pass. But in the final analysis, Lord, the most high, this will crack, I will let your will be done. And that's what's offering ourselves to the Lord. We offer him for his will to be done through us. So as believers, we don't walk out with the attitude, I want to do what I want to do. Lord, I want to do what you want me to do. See, that's not being religious. That's not even being churches. That is being normal. That is to be our normal way of operating. And we don't have to make big declarations of it. We just set our mind, our spirit to it. But we have to remain aware of it, <laughs> that I have offered my, I don't belong to myself. So when situation arises, and I, I don't want to divert too much, situation arises where I want my flesh to rise up, well, I'm not authorized. My flesh can't rise up because it don't belong to me anymore. I gave it away. <laughs> just like I give you my car and I still want to come to your house and drive it. I'm like, no, nah, I let Elder Marsh my car. And then I go over and start driving it. Now the benefit of him having a car is nullified because he said, well, I thought you lent me the car. Well, I did, but I'm going to drive it a little while. <laughs> I lent it to you, but I'm going to keep it. That kind of like a believer. I'm giving myself to you, Lord, but I still want to act the way I want to act. I want to do what I want to do, but I'm yours. See the hypocrisy in that? That's why I walk around all these foolish, confused Christians, I would say these people could be true believers, but they don't understand the essence of authority, who belongs to what, and how we need to conduct ourselves. And okay, <laughs> y'all, y'all, I don't get to do this often, I get off. But see, that is a key, key element. Because just using that analogy with, with Elder Moss, if I'm saying I'm giving him something and I just keep it, I didn't give it to him. <laughs> I'm, just, I'm, I'm confused and it, it bears no fruit. So we got to understand the significance when we start to be aware of the fact that we offer, make that sacrifice, then whatever God gives us back in return, and when we attune ourselves to him, now we live our life according to that. And we're going to get to that in Romans 12. Try not to rush through it, so, but... So that, that's important. And right now, when I personally see things that when I'm off kilter, somebody or another, I'm hanging on to somebody saying I've given to God. Like I'm going up and, and pickpocket God. Well, God, I know I gave you this, but I, I, let me just have some. I, I don't want that patience. I want to keep that patience. I, I want to be impatient now. I want to be humble for this time. Okay, God, I want you to give me the humility back to me. I want to take it back. And I want to go off right now. I'll give it back to you later. No. <laughs> That's what believers, that's what we spiritually do when we act on our own accord instead of the way the Lord would have. Once we know his character, in the time we get out of that character, we are taking back what we dedicate to God. So it can't be both ways. Just like the analogy with, with Elder Marsh, you know, I, I lend him the car, yet I'm driving it. But did I really lend it to him? I'm telling everybody I lend it to him, but no, he can't touch it. Steal my car. <laughs> It's the illusion. I want to sound good, but I'm not good. I want people to think I'm one thing, but I'm really not. <laughs> because when you look closely, like, well, I, I thought you lent the other mark the car. I did. You don't let him drive it, though. 
See how much that little sense that makes? But let, let's go on. First Peter. That's the first Peter. Yeah. Hopefully. First Peter chapter two, verses one through ten. Now we want to talk about help me, Lord, stay focused on why we have the authority to do this. Because I understand we're read in Leviticus, people bought all these sacrifices to the priest for the priest to offer it to the Lord. So to be able to uh, offer a sacrifice to God, we must be a priest. Okay, I think we all can agree on that. This man, woman, this is gender neutral. First Peter chapter two, verse one. Therefore, laying aside all malice, all deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and all evil speaking, as newborn babes desire the pure milk of the word that you may grow thereby. If indeed you have tasted the Lord, you have tasted that the Lord is gracious, coming to him as a living stone, rejected indeed by men, but chosen by God and precious. You also as living stones are built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices accepted to God through Jesus Christ. We must be in Jesus Christ. That gives us authority to offer sacrifices to the living God <laughs> because we are in Christ, the first living sacrifice. Therefore, it is also contained in the scripture, behold, I lay Zion, a chief cornerstone, elect, precious, and he who believes on him will by no means be put to shame. You see one thing right now, no matter how, what the circumstances are, if we are truly operating within Christ, the outcomes don't really matter. We're not really put to shame. Now, in this world way of definition, we may not look like we're in the right place. It may look like somehow somebody took advantage of us or things didn't work out. But see, that's not important. We got to be in tune enough, have confidence to know that whatever God will not put us to shame. Because men don't determine the situation of this three-dimensional Babylonian system does not decide whether or not we are in shame or whether we are living prosperously or not. The most high does. <laughs> because when we dedicate ourselves to him, our whole definition of life is determined by him. Success is by him. And we're going to talk about what success in him look like, too. And, and the word said we would not be put to shame a lot. Like, well, let me leave that alone. But I just think, Pastor Dave, I'll be thinking. Sometimes the bunny trails will take you way out in the deep space now. But that's something. Some Christians, I think, are afraid to do things because they're afraid it's going to be personal shame. Oh, I'm going to look embarrassed. I look embarrassed. Please. See, if you do. Okay, I better stop. When we're giving ourselves away to the most high, we can't be embarrassed. Is God ever embarrassed? No. Ergo, we are not ever embarrassed. Don't ever apply the world standards to your standard. Don't let people say that. Whatever. No. <laughs> Hopefully I've made the point. Let me go on. So therefore, to you who believe he, he is precious, but those who are disobedient, the stone are, but to those who are disobedient, the stone which the builder rejected had become a chief stone, cornerstone and a stumbling block and a rock of offense. That's really said those don't believe in Christ. He is a stumbling block to them and he become offensive to them because they don't, they don't believe. But let's focus on us. They stumble being disobedient to the word to which they were also appointed. See, they were given the word. They just would disobeyed them. They won't give themselves away. But you, I was talking about those of us who are faithful and true, but those, but you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, who once were not a people, but now the people of God who had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. See, before the penalty had to be paid, it hadn't been paid. Once Christ prayed it, boom, his blood was so powerful, it eradicated the penalty of sin. And when we're in him, we enjoy that same privilege, that same relationship with God that he has. And we have the power over sin. 
by being in Christ. <laughs> and the word, this is where Peter is, is explaining that priesthood is about God, uh, the Christ, his div divinity is so great and his sacrifice it was so encompassing that by getting in him we have the same privileges and don't ask me to explain it because it's way beyond my little feeble mind but i do know and i'm confident that we have the same privileges we have that mercy we have that ability to walk in that freedom to know that we are priests and we are not only authorized we are required to offer and go before the most high. We don't need to get anybody else to do it. I understand group prayer. I understand intercessory prayer. That is valid. That That is true. But on a personal relationship, because we're priests, mediators between mankind, and we're all human beings and the most high, we can go directly to the most high ourselves in the name of Jesus Christ, the Most High, the Christ. That's the only way. Because other than that, you haven't received the authority and the power of the cleansing power of his blood. You can't reject Christ and go before God. Yeah. You can't reject Christ and go to church and think you have the same privileges. Because right now I said those that are disobedient, they're like, oh no. <laughs> He's a stumbling block for those disobedient to the word to which they were appointed. So they were appointed a priest, but they're disobedient to their priesthood. That's all these jack led crooked, pimp preachers in here saying, talking from the Bible. They ain't talking about the Bible. They're holding church and, and saying God's name, but they're not saying what the Most High says. They're rebels, outlaws. <laughs> We, we need to know that, that 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 is not the way God would have us to conduct ourselves. And it's not on preach. I'm just not picking on preachers. But right now, it's saying we, if we disobey, we, we don't have that standard. We are neglecting our priesthood. Mm -hmm. Kind of like if you're in the, in the military or something and say you're in the army and you get out for whatever reason and you still have your ID card, but it's expired. You ride up to the gate and show them a card that's expired and try to get on the gate. But no, you're not getting on the gate. You know, they, they go, I've seen, they're going to stop all traffic and you're going to do a U-turn and go back from whence you came. <laughs> Just that way in the kingdom, once we reject to do God's will, once we reject to be obedient, we go to the kingdom and try to get them. The angel said, oh, no, you've been disobedient. You get a U-turn and you're going back out there in the kingdom of darkness. Now, I'm not saying you're going to hell, but you don't get the privileges of the kingdom. <laughs> That's how important this is to understand our priesthood, to understand our priesthood. We need nobody else to go before the Lord for us. We all have this equal privilege. Hopefully we all understand it. Let's move to, at last, Romans. Now I'm going to switch over to the New Living Translation. And make these four points out of Romans 12. I know y'all just it seemed like I was never going to get there, but we're there. <laughs> Romans 12. Hopefully we understand all our roles right now as a priest. That's why Paul is writing this. He's writing this so that people that grasp all the other principles, the, the role of the priesthood and significance of the priesthood and the fact that Christ became the living sacrifice He's a great high priest, and that right now through Peter writing through that word that we that believe and obedient to what to to, to 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 God through Christ are also a royal priesthood. Because I understand it, it says a brotherhood of priests, a nation of priests, in this in the, uh, this individual uh, status. So it's not like some are priests or some are not, and, and really you have to discard really the church order. But see, this really right now is that relationship between you and God. This is not about church hierarchy because there's different responsibilities with that. I didn't mention that, but hopefully I won't confuse anybody. Like, but I'm a priest. I don't need a pastor. Well, uh, good luck with that. <laughs> Just know that in the role of offering, uh, bringing ourselves to God, 
we have the responsibility to do that ourselves. <laughs> that is an individual responsibility. Because we can get, uh, uh, well, I was trying to avoid that. People, we can get confused about the titles and responsibilities. Hopefully we can make this a little clearer when we finish. But we do understand that each believer is part of a royal priesthood. And when it comes to that sacrificial, because it's called a uh, sacerdotal uh, anoint, uh, ordination, you know, the short, you know, for me to break it down, once you are a believer, you are authorized the free, priestly responsibility to offer a sacrifice, a living sacrifice, i.e. yourself, to the Most High. <laughs> That's not like a request. That is a requirement. <laughs> so that, that delineates between church offices. Because each believer has a priestful, priestly anointing upon them. It's priestly ordained to offer that sacrifice, to offer that sacrifice. See, hopefully that's clear because I, I don't want everybody, oh, I'm a preacher. I'm going to start a church. Well, <laughs> no, it's not really about that. Go see that. God's already got his order in church, which is something totally different. This is an individual thing. This is an individual. This is an individual relationship. This is an individual power. This is a, an individual benefit to being in Christ. <laughs> is to take that offering because only a priest can bring the offering. So we need to be aware of that because if we don't know we are priests, we cannot know we can offer ourselves to the Lord and live a dedicated life, which translates over to the first point I'm trying to make. If you don't see yourself as a priest, Romans 12 will not make any sense to you. Because <laughs> now it's become deeper. Now, I, not that I know everything, but now Romans 12 is much clearer to me <laughs> because now I see where the authority to do this comes from. And let's read Romans 12. Verse 1 and 2 talks about dedication. And again, I'm reading from the New Living Translation. Apostle Paul writes, And so, dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to give your bodies to God because he has because of all he's done for you let them be a living and holy sacrifice the kind he will find acceptable this is truly the way to worship him don't copy the behavior and customs of the world but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. So what the Paul, Paul, I know I know in some it says, which is a reasonable service. So when we read this, it's a small thing. Paul said, I'm pleading with you. Paul said, it's so important. I am begging you to do this. So let our bodies be that living and holy, holy sacrifice. The kind he will find acceptable. Yeah, I like the fact said this is truly the way to worship him. It's amazing. You don't say anything about go to church every day, <laughs> read your Bible every day, pray every day. He said, no, give yourself to the Lord. Because <laughs> think about it, if we all, everyone that's sitting in Christ, practice this on a daily basis. <laughs> and it, 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 one, it, it says being, but let God transform the way you, into a new person by changing the way you think. And it says being transformed. To me, I see this as ongoing. I think, I think I asked Sister Liz, I think this is pre present participle. This is not a one-time event. This is a constant way of living. That's why it's a living sacrifice. See, if you offer a sacrifice to die, you can't do that but once. But as a sacrifice of living, you can give it over and over and over and over again. Matter of fact, yeah, I would say, if you like me, you're required to give it over and over and over again. 
because this transformation is is ongoing. <laughs> it's nothing worse than somebody to get saved and stay the same for a whole bunch of years. That's right. That's contrary to God's will. And it says, don't copy the behavior of the and customs of the world, but let God transform you, transform you into a new person by the way you think, not what we do. Because once we are our, our method our way of thinking is transformed by the most high then what we do is going to be transformed because we only do if you're anywhere close to where i feel that i am what i do everything i do i think about it first i don't end up doing something and say like oh why did i do that if we're honest with ourselves like yeah i thought about that sometimes I get to talking i'm like man that sure was stupid yep sure was I thought about it, still did it. That, that, that makes it double stupid. I knew better than did it anyway. <laughs> but we do understand that our actions, our way of being, who we are, our essence start with what we think, who we think, how we think, that leads to the actions that we have. It's not the other way around. That's why Satan has no power to make any of us do anything. He tried to trick us into thinking certain ways, which will lead to certain actions. And unfortunately, in America, he's very successful, but uh, I'm going to leave that one alone too, Pastor, today. <laughs> All I do is look at Fox News. <laughs> then we will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleases and perfect. So really, to know what God wants us to do, we have to offer him ourselves to let him transform the way we think. And then we will get revelation of his good and perfect will for our life. And therein will give us peace and security. <laughs> therein we won't be trying to compete, trying to be something we're not meant to be. Letting other people lead us around and control and influence us without even knowing it, knowing that we've submitted ourselves to some lunacy without knowing it's lunacy. Because a lot of believers do not bother to think for themselves. They let other people do it. And just fall around like lemons. Not me. Nope. Not going to do it. Not going to do it because we have to rely on the most high. And if we don't know our appreciative responsibility to offer ourselves, we will not reach that full potential of what God would have us to do. It's impossible. Because otherwise, I'm only going to think as much, you know, to the ability that I can rationalize things. But when we yield the way we think and let the most high, transform our way of thinking, then we get greater revelation of him. We have to look at the word through world through his eye and we're able to discern things, what we should do, what we should not do, what he wants us to do, what he does not want us to do. If what we do, he will have us ways to do it. He said, okay, go this far and do more, do this, go there and, and think about this. This is not that significant. So, okay, some things of me, God, like, Okay, do this, don't do that. Okay, that's optional. Even sometimes you'll let us decide, but okay, either way. So I talked to a real good friend. I mean, he had two opportunities for a great job. They both were great. And he didn't, he gave me all of the nuances of it. I'm like, well, bro, I don't see where you're going to lose with either one. It looks like God is just giving you an option to choose what you want because they both are beneficial. <laughs> Got to do that. <laughs> but usually when I get there and I don't know, I'm like, okay, God, not lead me clearly in one direction. Said, okay, okay, my child, I, I can trust you enough. <laughs> I know you <laughs> to make the decision right here I'm giving you, you know, kind of like Abraham and Lot did. So, okay, you choose the other side, I'll go the other way. You know, Lot made a bad decision, but at times God would just allow us to uh, make the decision ourselves by giving us Two beneficial options. I, I think the most high has no problem with blessing us the way we want to be blessed. Because see, it wouldn't make sense for, for God to try to give me and bless me in the way that he blessed. And I'm not picking on Elder Morris like Elder Morris. I mean, we are like two totally different type things. What he enjoys, I'm like, well, I don't do that. <laughs> Nothing bad with it. I just don't do it. And the same way. We don't live the same. The same thing doesn't put us in that spiritual high place. So he would allow us to make options because, okay, for my servant, Elder Marshall, we, I have 
you, I want you to make this choice to do this. And it can be the same type there. Okay, for you, brother Ed, I want you to do this. And you see, they're different, but they both are pleasing. They both are edifying. Mm -hmm. So one thing, that's why God does not want us around here trying to copy and be somebody else. Yes. He got an Elder John. He don't need to. Not he'd have made him an identical twin. So <laughs> since he only made one, let him have his. So we need to be confident in that. So first thing we got to do is have dedication. Let's read. Okay, yes, I'm going to finish. Let's look at verses three through eight. This is service through the gifts of the spirit. Service through the gifts of the spirit. Still in Romans 12, verse three. So because of the privilege and authority God has given me, I give each of you this warning. Do not think you are better than you really are. Be honest in your evaluation of yourself. Measuring yourself by the faith God has given us. Just as our bodies have many parts and each part has a special function, so it is with Christ's body. We are many parts of one body and we all belong to each other. We all belong to each other. We all belong to each other. In his grace, God has given us different gifts for doing certain things well. So if God has given you the ability to prophesy, speak out with as much faith as God has given you. If your gift is serving, serving others, serve them well. If you are a teacher, teach well. If your gift is, encourage, is to encourage others, be encouraging. If it is giving, give generously. If God has given you leadership ability, take the responsibility seriously. And if you have a gift for showing kindness to others, do it gladly. <laughs> so God is basically telling us in this to me, get to know me and in knowing me and submit yourself to me, now you will know yourself. <laughs> get to know God. We get to know God more. And then we get to know ourselves more. <laughs> And guess what, brothers and sisters? We become more secure in what God has equipped us with. Just take whatever you have, be content with whatever you have, and just do the best that we can at what he's given us. Because there's nothing more frustrating than kind of trying to be something that you are not. Because <laughs> I have tried that, and it does not work. <laughs> Because God keeps revealing it and it keeps putting us in situations where if we don't continue to follow this process, we will be frustrated. That's why I think some people end up in ministry and they don't last. And you see other people can do a ministry and they just excel at it. Not that one was better than the other, the other person was out of place and they didn't know. Because I found whatever he's given us, you will be compelled to want to do it. And whatever he's not giving you, you will be compelled to not even get involved. That's why you need to be comfortable in church. So don't you'll never see me in trying to join the praise team up there. Don't know, don't have, they have zero notes. <laughs> don't even know a note. I'm so tone deaf, I hardly hear my hardly hear myself. But I want to be on the choir because I want to be seen. <laughs> but you can't sing. <laughs> well, I do a milli vanilli. I just move my lips because I want to be seen in the praise team. I said, no, fool. <laughs> See, we do that. I'm using that as an as a over-the-top type uh, example. But see, if we follow this, now I'm confident. You know, my gift is like, you know, picking up the trash. Good. I want to make sure all the trash is picked up all day, every day. Nothing wrong with that. Because there's nothing worse than everybody not fulfilling their role, and then you got lacking. Your pastor Dave can be doing the greatest sermon ever at KCM. But guess what? If the people that have ability to love people and to greet people and to make people relax and do this, don't do that. Somebody walk in, nobody greet them. You know, the greeters, you know, you don't feel welcome. You just sort of come in like you're the movie theater. Oh, here's the ticket. Go find your seat. Da, 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 da. Guess what? That sermon is nullified because the person not receiving it. So when each part gets in its place, and we understand that everything works together and there's nothing in the kingdom that's more important than anybody else's ministry. 
we all have the same equal importance in ministry that only the most high <laughs> is elevated above everybody else. Now we all work together in harmony. And God is glorified. I think you would just said a lot. Just stay in our lane. Stay in your lane. And don't be ashamed if you, you know, some of us might have a big lane. Some of us may have a narrow, narrow, a narrow lane. Because <laughs> I find spiritually, the older I got, my lane has gotten narrow and narrow. <laughs> and that is okay. Because <laughs> I'm old. I like to take naps. I don't like to be putting a lot of stuff on my plate. <laughs> but what's on my plate, I like to do well. <laughs> So I had to face the reality. Well, I can do it well, but you know, I, I might do two things. Sometimes it might be one, but you put the most into whatever it is. And we don't worry about what you're not doing. Just be confident and dedicated to what we have been led to do. All right, service. Now we're going to look at one of the major problems in the church, relationships within God's family, 19 through 16. No, 9 through 16, I'm sorry. Romans 12, 9 through 16. I like to title this, Relationships Within God's Family. How are we to relate to each other? Oh, look how it starts. Romans 12, chapter 9, verse 9. Don't just pretend to love others. Really love them. Hate what is wrong. Hold tightly to what is good. Love each other with genuine affection and take delight in honoring each other. Never be lazy, but work hard and serve the Lord enthusiastically. Rejoice in your confident hope. Be patient in trouble and keep praying. When God's people are in need, be ready to help them. Always be eager, eager always be eager to practice hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Do not curse them. Pray that God will bless them. Be happy with those who are happy. Weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with each other. Do not be too proud to enjoy the company of ordinary people. And don't think you know it all. I like the way it, it, it starts off verse 9 and says, don't just pretend to love others. <laughs> just don't pretend to love others. And I've told some about the, the episode, I, uh, the situation I had with someone was at this place, I just use it as a parable, where people behave one way in the church, you know, at certain, certain time we had this certain uh, portion of the service go around and hug each other. And I'm not talking about KCM for the record. And everybody was just going through these motions. Everybody's, you know, laughing, skinning and grinning and hugging and stuff. And you would think it was great. Everybody generally cared to each other. But then service is out and you run into the same people that were hugging you 10 minutes, 15 minutes ago in the church at the uh, at a restaurant. They won't even sit with you. <laughs> I mean, it's happened. So I'm like, okay, which one is the real you? The you in the restaurant that won't know, won't, don't even want to be in close proximity to me? Or that little fake skin and the grinning one in church that wanted everybody to see you hugging people that didn't look like you? I knew which one was the real one. <laughs> that's why, you know, I think that's why Apostle Paul started with it. Don't be hypocritical about your love. Don't act one way in the gathering and knowing that this is not genuinely how you feel about the person. And to go back to transition and brag a little bit, that's what I love about KCM with, with me and I'm sure the women are the same way too, is the way we are in church, we're that way everywhere, 24 seven. But sometimes they've seen us on the men's retreat and people like, <laughs> guy called us a bunch of one server in the uh, Golden Corral was telling a guy that oh those are a bunch of religious guys well they don't look too religious to us you know head on our backs and stuff but now we're not we love each other though i mean we don't know we mean we ain't got to be in that way we the real men you, you don't know we ain't sitting here being wimps we talking our cash because we get ready to go to the bowling tournament see that's what they didn't understand 
we were that was the pre trash talking portion for the bowling tournament. <laughs> So we wouldn't know, oh, praise the Lord, there. No, no, no. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> we were showing that genuine love when we were coming at each other because it was a psychological warfare before we went bowling. That's showing the love. I'm thinking, if I'm going bowling against somebody, I'm not going to try. No, I'm not on your team. I love you, but I'm trying to beat your brains out. <laughs> okay. I can see why they misinterpreted us, but it, 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 was, it, it was good. I enjoyed that because we had the freedom to be ourselves. But God, you know, that's just one example. But God would say, show that gentleman love. Don't pretend. Say, hey, what's wrong? Somebody doing something wrong, don't, don't give them a pass because they're your buddy. That's wrong. So hold tightly, which is good. Love each other with genuine affection. So take delight in honoring others. See, I love that. I think KCM, I think we specialize in that. Somebody get blessed, I'm probably celebrating harder than they are. I'm like, yes, get some more. <laughs> to never be lazy, but work hard, serving the Lord enthusiastically. Rejoice in your confident hope. Be patient in trouble. Keep praying. When God's people are in need, be ready to help. See, that, that is a staple. That's not setting up a whole bunch of requirements, interrogating people, want to see their finances for the last three years, they tithe them records no somebody need help they need help <laughs> i need help i need help i don't need to be scrutinized and evaluated it's not like the church not like you're going to the bank applying for a loan it's supposed to be your brother help me out you know part of the help can be if i did something irresponsible let me know i did something irresponsible that goes along with the help not just bail me out because i keep getting in trouble and being irresponsible part of the help is letting me know i was in irresponsible so so we have to be honest and, and follow through this. And we see that these are the relationships we had within the, the body of Christ that we're supposed to have. And lastly, I want to look at the um, verses 17, 17 through 21. This is the relationships we're to have outside God's family. Because we've got to understand that when we say that we are believers or we mention uh, anybody that knows that we are believers, we're going to be scrutinized by the world. And I'm a firm believer that you do not have to bring people to the church service for them to see the most high. <laughs> Let's show them God where we are. <laughs> that's not deferring responsibility, but that's not true. There's nothing in here. It says, well, great commission is going to the world, make disciples. It just said going to the world and bring the people to church and build a congregation. Never see, I haven't seen anything, and correct me if I'm wrong, anybody. Never seen where God, Christ commissioned the, the apostle to go out and build buildings and collect people. <laughs> says, make disciples. We got to have influence on people, positive influence. But let's look at how we re relate to the world. 17, to never pay back evil with more evil. Do things in such a way that everyone can see you are honorable. Do things in such a way that everyone can see you are honorable. Do all that you can to live in peace with everyone. Dear friends, never take revenge. Leave that to the righteous anger of God. For the scriptures say, I will take revenge. I will pay them back, says the Lord. Instead, if your enemies are hungry, feed them. If they are thirsty, give them something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals of shame on their head. Do not let evil conquer you, but conquer evil by doing good. Real simple, to the point. We have a way that, that we are to conduct ourselves. The whole purpose of understanding that we are priests and we offer ourselves to the Most High is to know that in doing that, we become that living sacrifice. And we'd always be that living sacrifice, giving ourselves to God, and he gives us what we need to bring glory to him. But you got to un understand one thing is priests, to bring glory to God. He wants us to be in a position to receive respect, to receive the uh, 
influence on this earth. He wants us to be. He doesn't want us all up being necessarily in tourist well known, but he wants us all with the position to represent his kingdom on earth. So understand by giving ourselves to him, like Tom said, when we give ourselves away, now we are going to serve him. But understand that's not a loss, that's a gain. Because we give ourselves to him, then he gives us ourselves plus him back to us, if that makes sense. He has his spirit in it and he gives us, by his Holy Spirit, he awakens us and he constantly changes us. He constantly makes us aware of what he is doing in his kingdom and how we are to conduct ourselves in every situation. So we never dishonor the Lord. And the world may try to make it look like we lost. We don't lose. You can't lose. Because they plan by a different sort of pillar rule. And they don't comprehend what had happened, how it lives. Because the final announcement, Paul said, well, I die daily. He wasn't talking about physically dying. Paul like, my will dying daily. Because, you know, stuff go get us in a position where we want to come back at folk. Paul said, no, every day I have to put myself down so God can be glorified in my life. And really, that's the most glorious, peaceful, satisfying way to live. Now, it won't look the same to the world. So, so don't think that the world is, oh, yeah, raise the roof. We really like the fact you're cruci. No, they're going to be like the high free. They keep trying to put us on up on that metaphorical cross. <laughs> world wants to kill and crucify us. But you can't kill what's already dead. <laughs> Let us pray. Father, we thank you. For your word we thank you for your love we thank you for your peace and your joy and i pray father god that our time together has been edifying to each of us and that we'll father god we've given you honor and glory right now i ask you to forgive me father god if i said did anything that was inappropriate father god anything that didn't bring you honor and glory just right now father god continue to show us how to be instruments of your kingdom here on this earth in jesus name amen